Hello, I'm Sarah Jane Fellini. I reside here in these beautiful woods of Montague, Michigan, next to this great lake with my dog, Miles, and my artist husband, Ron Fallon. And we haven't always lived here. I've been here about five years now full time because I'm retired from Rivermont Collegiate where I taught art K through 12 for 28 years. And we used to come up here every summer and I loved it, the area so much. We bought a little um, house that's a trapezoid and we've had a lot of fun fixing it up and making it uh, a full-time home. And my husband built me a little two-room house behind the larger house and that's just my art place and uh, I'd be glad to show anybody around there anytime they wanted to come out. I think everyone is born an artist. It's just that not everyone has a chance to be exposed to art and to learn the skills so that they can make things the way they want to see them. And you know, the more times you get to go to museums and watch other artists make their work, you grow along with them. I mean, experiences are one thing, and they creep into your work off and on. You know, when you paint, it is, at the end of that brush, is the amount of sleep you got, what you ate, <laughs> what's bothering you. I mean, your whole nervous system is at the end of that brush. But as far as um, being inspired and stimulated and getting ideas, for me, it's my art collection, my collection of books. And I just, I just go upstairs and go to the bookshelf and pull a couple off and um, I start flipping through them and before long I just have new images all of a sudden and looking at art makes you think about other things and um, then the pieces start coming together. It, it happens real easily these days for me but I remember uh, in the past really searching for new ideas and there's just so many that are there right now. I'm, I'm hoping I have enough lifetime to do them all. And the swans come around here, and I love to study the clouds. I often get into my rowboat and row out there and just anchor and sit and feel the waves and clear out. I've often wanted to paint what I see down here because it's the the bay is kind of like a little European village. It's so beautiful, the glistening of the water, the sound of the waves. In ancient history, the information tends to be sketchy because the fabric disintegrates in time from the weather. But fragments date back to the first century, and it was discovered in ancient Egyptian tombs, even on the wrappings of the mummies. By the 13th century, it was highly accomplished art form and the pastime for fine ladies. In the 17th century, um, it was introduced to Holland and the Dutch explorers and took it to all these different countries, Javanese, the coastal islands, um, Sudanese, the Balinese, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, China, and Africa. Different areas have different designs in their boutiques, and that only makes sense in certain colors. The indigo plant grows along some of the rivers in Indonesia and those particular villages are known to have the blue and the brown. In the 1900s, the Germans, um, with all their fashionable travel, brought Batik back to its homeland and they had also developed a factory type situation where um, Batik's being used for garments were done um, like assembly lines, many people doing certain parts to each one. So uh, I, I must say that I'm very humbled uh, when I do the research for boutiques because mine are nothing like anything that they sell commercially or consider um, 
fatigues that have many more enduring processes than my system. Mine's a um, contemporary adaptation to uh, taking the batik resist method and turning it into my own art as wall hangings and tapestries. So then I put the cloth right over, right on top of the drawing. I've already drawn a little bit on this. So. so in other words, I'm using the window as a light box and put the drawing, the cloth right on top of the drawing and then I draw the lines. And of course, I couldn't stop doing it. I had to do it right then and there. I couldn't wait for Chelsea. I had to do it. So now we have a ballpoint pen on the cloth, and the cloth is an antique uh, tablecloth. Okay. And if you think about it, you Almost anyone can do it in their own kitchen because you have a heat source and you have water. I have electric wok that I use, but I started out with the Sunbeam uh, fry pan and anything like that that you can control the heat with is really wonderful. Once you use it for the wax, you don't ever want to use it for anything else. And then if you have candles around the house, that you're no longer going to use. You can melt those down and the candles will give you a lot of crackle. And if you pick up beeswax at the beekeepers or the wine meadery or where they sell honey, lots of times they sell beeswax. The beeswax will give you no crackle so you can solidify and have plain areas. Underneath the fabric and the fabric needs to be all natural underneath the fabric is a mat and we found out that stamps work a lot better if you have fabric folded up and underneath that is cardboard and then my work table I like to work on a hard surface a lot of boutique artists stretch them on a frame but then you get all these holes all the way around on your project and um, then you have to allowed to hide those holes. You can paint with a brush, a Q-tip. I even read some of the more cryptic uh, ancient times they took cotton and put it on the end of a stick and painted with that. You always have to hold something underneath the brush so you don't trip on your fabric where you don't want so when you're painting batik, you want to paint in all the area that you want to um, capture and keep, and then you, you, you jump over and take a little space and leave a little space open that will define your areas. The chanting tool is a little stick that has like a metal spoon on the end with a spout. I have several, I have about 15 or 16 of them and each one is a different thickness of line. And I like a medium line best. Batik means to dot. I looked it up and so many artists in the beginning of time just used these tools to make their whole design was a series of little dots. I have these Indonesian blocks and I have six different kinds that make six different designs. You take the blocks and you heat them up in the wax and you stamp them onto your material and oftentimes they make borders and you can use all kinds of different um, designs and shapes and 
form your batik with those blocks. And in Indonesia, uh, most of the fabrics are totally blocked and the whole piece is blocked in and it, it's so laborious. It takes so much time to do that because I'm working on one right now and hopefully by the time this video tape presentation comes around and what you, when you're watching this that um, that tablecloth will be on display for you to see. I have these stamps, these little stamps. They come, they're a set of 16, and there's a dolphin, uh, some triangles, and flower, octagon. And you would take these and put them in your wax and let them warm up, and then you'd go into your fabric, like that. Little dolphin. And what we're doing is, this is all resist, where I put the wax now, where I put the wax now, that'll stay there forever. It's the dyeing sets the mood. The dyeing is the essential color of the whole piece. So you sort of have to think ahead while you're also thinking backwards, if that makes any sense, because you start with yellow. Okay, I know I want yellow in it, but I also want orange and red and brown. So, uh, I'm going to put it in yellow and then I'm going to paint all the areas I want yellow. But then I'm going to put it in red and I'm going to get, I'm not going to get red because the yellow is already there. I'm going to get orange. So I might have to skip the red. So you have to kind of think about your colors. And for many years, I would just surprise myself. Well, I'll just put it in this bucket and see what happens. But now I really planned them out because I've lost too many <laughs> to experimenting. I've lost, um, it didn't turn out the way I really wanted it to do. And it's hard to control this part because um, you always have to remember what color's underneath. Um, if you have red already on your boutique and you want something blue, you're not gonna get blue because when you put it in blue, it's gonna turn purple. So you have to forget the red or hand paint the red in separately and then wax over that area and then go into the blue. Okay, these are the dyes I use, the Procyon from Dick Blick. They come in these little jars. They're about seven or eight dollars a piece. As you can see, I have a variety of wonderful colors here. And um, this is a Dan Mon dye, that's permanent fabric dye, also from Dick the Catalog. And this one someone brought to me, it's called Tulip dye. And um, it looks to be like a French dye. And what I prescribed, this is I dye poly, which means it's for polyester. All these dyes are for um, natural fibers that would be cotton, linen, muslin. And the antique uh, tablecloths, we mostly have to guess and just experiment to see how the dyes go on. This would be only for polyester. These kinds of dyes will not work on polyester, so they need natural fibers, and I like them better, uh, less toxic. A natural dye, this is dye made from grape juice. So I would prescribe that you read the directions on the back and follow the direction of each kind. Most of the time you add some vinegar or baking soda or salt, but usually not all three at once. And you can bring old dyes back. I've had um, dyes evaporate and there's this color in the bottom, you just add water. They also can be frozen, but to storm you need to be in a dark place with a lid. So here we have a crane that is yellow and gold on the top and blue on the bottom. And I thought I'd show you the magic right here in front of us by laying the crane down into the die. Down into the die and then I'm going to push it around in the die. Okay. 
magic is starting right now. We're watching the magic happen. Here we go. Can you see what was gold is now blue? Because the dye went into the areas that I hadn't painted. And this is the magic of the resist. Let it sit in here for a little while. I have plain water in a jar and I'm going to wet the area that I want to paint orange. Because this is the only place on the whole boutique that's going to be orange is the beak of the crane. So I'm using dry dye in this jar, and I'm wetting the brush, and then I'm painting the dry dye right into this small area that will dye the eye of the crane and the beak. And I could do this other places too if I wanted this color, but Completely submerging is my technique to get richer colors and deeper colors. But if I want to, um, for the sake of, if I want to cheat a little bit, <laughs> I can paint some dye on small areas. It doesn't come out as vibrant. Right. Okay, so now we're going to talk about ironing which is really the simplest part because anybody can do this. You just take your ironing board and you pad it with lots of newspapers. You unfold them and you have several layers, maybe six layers of newspaper. And then you place your batik down and then you put one or two pieces on top of that and you turn your iron as hot as it'll get and the new irons don't get as hot as the old irons. So if you can find an old iron or bar, oh, one thing you need to know, the iron may never be used for anything else besides batik because the wax will get inside the iron. It won't hurt the iron, but it'll hurt the next thing you go to iron. Like if you're doing a nice white shirt, you'll get wax marks on it. So then you, you iron, and you see that the paper turns sort of wet or dark in the areas where it's bringing the wax up into the paper. Then you unpeel the paper and you discard it into a plastic bag. And I leave mine so there's some body to the batik, so there's a little bit of stiffness left in it, because that's the way I like them to be. But you could just keep spending hours and hours ironing and ironing and ironing till it gets completely out. The wax is totally removed. So today we're going to look at cranes and I'm going to talk a little bit about the cranes as I look at them. In Chinese lore, it was prosperity, the symbol of longevity and hospitality. And um, the crane has followed me for many, many years in and out of different uh, projects. I started with intaglio prints when I was doing printmaking back at St. Ambrose. And um, I had seen cranes that summer up around the UP. And I was intrigued and started looking them up in books. Next we're going to look at the crane that it has this uh, teal blue for a background and all the detail is what I took the chanting tool and drew the designs that I saw in the old antique tablecloth that I could see, I could faintly see that the threads were forming these little flowers and so I took the chanting tool and copied them with the hot wax and it's supposed to look like babbling brook, uh, the water rolling down and around the crane's head and down the side. As a little more detail in his eye and his beak standing on a white rock.
The crackle in the background from the paraffin seemed to add a lot of texture. This one is the darkest in the series. And then again, I tried to follow the design of some of the motif that was woven into the fabric. With my chanting tool, those are the white lines on the right here. It's supposed to look like um, rocks or part of the brook. The fabric was totally wet when I applied the blue and it ran. And then when that was dried, I painted my beeswax over that and then submerged the whole batique in this olive green and um, painted all the areas I wanted to keep green and then submerged it in the dark brown, which is a, a lot of our uh, morning coffee grounds that we soaked and made a dye out of. This particular batik has a lot of detail in the wing and I was able to capture individual feathers. Well, this crane is the crane that's um, st again standing on the rock by the water and the blocking I've done on the left hand side, let's see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, are the snowflakes falling down and there's a moon behind the crane and a border that's been blocked in along the bottom. All right, now we're looking at the crane with the pink background, sort of a salmon pink background. And I was thinking about the sunset and the colors in the sunset um, that we see here in beautiful Michigan. And you can find my work at Studio 2, downtown Montague, and at Payne's Interior, which is also in Montague. The Golden Monkey has a few and then in Whitehall at the Arts Council, and in Grand Haven at the Armory or um, Gallery Uptown. And um, the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired in Grand Rapids had a show for Ron and I last year. It lasted four months over the summer, and they have off offered us the opportunity to come back again. And that was my connection with Kendall as a part-time teacher there. And I also teach classes at um, uh, White Lake Arts Council. And, um, I wanted to really thank the Friends of Art for giving me this opportunity. I like to share my work. Now that I'm retired, I have more time to really put myself into it. And I do it every day. <laughs> It's uh, my play, you could say it's my therapy, and it's also my friends. 